the uh, talk, we have uh, Parola Kristen Sun. Thank you. Let's see if the pro oh, it works amazing. Uh, so um, uh, I'm giving the talk, but the true hero is the first author here, Chao Chi Gu, a first year uh, uh, undergraduate student at the University of Cambridge. But he's in China uh, figuring out how to manufacture this thing, so unfortunately he didn't have time to go come and give the talk. And I'm going to present Dexmo. And what we are basically tackling here, similar to what you've heard in previous talks, is basically how to provide a compelling and sort of convincing uh, force feedback to users in virtual reality. So there has been a lot of previous approaches. They're all cited and discussed in the, in the notes, and I'll refer to the note for the details. But the gist of it is that they are not really fit for purpose. They're either bulky or they're expensive, or they are not mobile or ineffective. Um, and what we are trying to do here is to solve this problem in a, in a way that we basically, we call it pass, active, active passive haptics. So what you do is you basically have the user wear a mechanical exoskeleton as a sort of a glove. And the gist of it is that once you're moving this glove, these um, uh, gears uh, uh, and ratchet wheels are going to be uh, free rolling, okay? So the exoskeleton just seamlessly follows you and it's very dexterous. When there is a signal, right, sent from the computer that the user's, user's finger in the, in the real physical world is actually holding on or touching an object in the virtual world, then the exoskeleton will lock the corresponding joints in place. And the way we do that is uh, we have this little uh, device at the bottom here with two uh, uh, rotational sensors. And this is normally free rolling. And once we want to lock it in place, we have a stopping slider here, so there's a linear motion that is actuated by the device. This stopping slider will then uh, uh, block the ratchet wheel, and hence you, the user cannot physically move the finger anymore. So it's actually physically blocked by exoskeleton. So which actually, if you think about it, makes a lot of sense, because most objects we touch are actually rigid in the physical world, and this provides a very, very rigid experience, right? Because it actually blocks the joints. It's sort of a breaking approach, right? We basically break the mechanical exoskeleton at the appropriate point. I'll show you a video in a second. Uh, uh, at the time of the paper, we had a simplified tracking, uh, tracking model. Now it's actually a little bit more sophisticated, but let me first talk about it. We basically have rotational sensors attached to, to each of the joints, and then we get the sensing data, and then we basically compute a forward kinematics change using the standard algorithms, and then back calculate the position of each joint relative to the base of the ex exoskeleton. And we track the MCP joints and, in, and then interpolate the DIP and the PIP joints uh, via linear uh, regression. So we basically collected a bunch of samples from five representative users and seemed to track, uh, uh, fit, a fit a linear regression model uh, to the system. Now, why would this be a good idea? So I think there are four good solution principles for this approach. So one is it's effective, actually. It turns out you know, we don't actually need very fine-grained continuous feedback in order to provide, you know, a good enough uh, 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 force feedback experience or immersive experience for VR. That's our claim. Uh, but second, and very importantly, this can actually be mobile. Because we are not using and imposing any active force on the user, we don't actually require much power. So we actually, a simple standard mobile phone battery lasts for four hours uh, using the device. And the device can also be made relatively lightweight. It weighs about 270 grams, and that number can go down. And because it's so lightweight and doesn't require much power, it doesn't, obviously doesn't require Tether connection, and you can actually have it you know, used wirelessly and carried with you. And currently, the device actually can be used wirelessly already. Another important principle is to keep things safe. And this is a very safe device, right? Because all it's doing is breaking the joints. If it, for some reason, would fail, uh, nothing bad would actually happen. You would just be free moving, right? Other systems, uh, mechanical systems that use pulleys and strings might risk, for instance, bending the joints of the user right, and damaging the user or injuring the user. And also very importantly, if you actually want to have some real impact, you actually have to be able to build this thing. And this can actually be made inexpensive. It can be mass produced and turned into manufacturing instructions because it only relies on inexpensive rotational sensors and the other part can be done using injection molding. So this is an early demo of the device. So you can see the guy moving around. And now there is a ball connected to the exoskeleton. And you can see there at the end that his, uh, his limb is locked, uh, his finger is locked in place by the exoskeleton. 
And that's essentially how it works. So it's very easy. You put it on, move around your fingers. Whenever you know, your computer system or your virtual world system is telling you that the, the user's, uh, use, user's fingers should, should, should not be able to move through you know, a virtual object, the exoskeleton simply locks in place. And there's an SDK, so it can be used with Unity, for instance. This is what we used for our little study, which I will talk about in a second. So our claim is this is effective. You know, the accuracy is reasonably good. The response time is reasonably good. It's definitely mobile. It's definitely safe. And it can actually be mass produced. So this is a note. So we didn't have that much space or time, to be frank, to do a sophisticated study about exactly that, you know, the fine, uh, how, how, how well they're tracking, to give you very precise numbers on tracking, etc. We're doing that at the moment. But we did do a small study to show you the power of the SDK and the system as it currently is. So we created an archery game from scratch using Unity and recruited uh, 20 participants via convenience sampling. And we have them basically doing a simple, playful, immersive task. So they pick an arrow and they put it into the, uh, uh, the bow and let go and basically try to hit targets. Uh, and we basically compared using Dexmo versus not using Dexmo. Okay. So you know, within subject design, so every participant was, was exposed to both conditions. And what we noticed is that the error rate dropped from 61 to 44 percent, statistically significant, etc. And but, but more important is that people really liked it, right? They really felt that you know it, it feel it felt subjectively immersive, and there was lots of uh, enthusiastic comments such as these ones. Uh, and this is basically Dexmo. I want to show you a longer video here while I close off. So it's a mechanical exoskeleton, and we, we pr produces what we call active-passive feedback. So rather than reappropriating physical devices, as we have heard before, we basically um, uh, lock the exoskeleton in place and therefore provide passive haptics via you know, an active uh, mechanism, a mechanical mechanism. And we, we, our claim is that it's effect effective, it's definitely mobile, it's safe, and it can be mass produced, turn into mass in manufacturing instructions and be mass produced and sold at a, you know, a sensible retail price. And if you want to know more about it, you know, uh, how to buy it or talk to us or you want to develop for it, you know, I would be very happy to talk with you after the talk. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, Demeter from ETH Zurich. Um, I was thinking back when I watched the uh, demonstration, what if you made the device even simpler, uh, let's say without any uh, motors or anything, just always limited to a very specific sort of grabbing lens, like always block when the user is about, let's say, grabbing that much, which to me seems applicable in many situations. For example, your bow and arrow application. I mean, this hand will be about that much, and then this that much. What would that work? What, what, what? Do you have any thoughts on that? So actually, we have filed a bunch of patents on basically every conceivable way to do this. Okay. <laughs> so I don't want to comment too much about it, but there are definitely other ways to do it, including to provide actually both discrete feedback and actually continuous feedback by using a little bit of extra power. So, and, uh, yeah, I think I, t I can talk to you later about okay. it. Um, Matty Osmandian from University of Southern California. Mm, great talk, by the way. Um, so I just want to understand better how the, <laughs> the bow and arrow experience works. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I understand if you can, like, the grabbing notion, how you can provide that feeling. But what kind of sensations are you exactly feeling? I presume you're feeling the bow in your hand. Yep. What's the other hand exactly yeah, feeling? Yeah, it's a very thick string, basically, right? But right. what you're always feeling, like, let, let me, let me very, be very clear, right? It's rigid feedback you're feeling, right? Correct. You're not feeling any continuous feedback. It's right. either on or off. So when you're, when I'm, with my right hand, for instance, when I'm pulling back, am I feeling anything in my right hand? No, you're not feeling anything then, right? Okay, because, so the left yeah, hand is because feeling it's not a continuous. Right, the left hand is feeling the bow. The system we used in the experiment was not a continuous right. one. We have a continuous one actually oh, okay. at the moment, but that was not used in the study. Right, but so you wouldn't feel that. You would only feel if you're actually touching something which is supposed to be radiated. But you don't feel yeah, like a so. stretching motion or like anything like no, that. No, you wouldn't. Okay. All right, no, thank you. That requires continuous feedback. Uh, yeah. So I'm DJ from the Media Lab. Yeah. And I have a speech impediment, but I'm going to try my best to answer my ask my question. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, forgive me for answering, uh, answering a blunt question, um, but um, so I've been following Desmo for a very long time, and we've been trying to like uh, we've been trying to order a Desmo, but it's been it's been in a pre-order state for a really long time. Did you comment on like I mean, is it going to release as a public product or something? So uh, we are basically have um, I think about six versions at the moment. <laughs> 
So uh, basically, we want to. It's actually available for pre-release for you know for uh, selected partners. Uh, but basically, we wanted to 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 enable to do a wider release. We wanted to be just basically the experience to get the experience just right. Okay. But we are there at the moment, so please be patient. I'm really happy to hear you're, you're a fan. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.